There are three types of statistical studies that we will be looking at over the course of this year. The first are surveys, and surveys are snapshots. They give you a quick view at one moment in time of a population or a sample from a population. I think the classic example are the research polls that are conducted before elections. Typically, those researchers will ask, ask participants, either on a particular day or over the course of a particular week, what their preferences are in an election, and then use those results to predict the outcome. Now, a more, sig a more substantial type of statistical study is an observational study, and those are more long-term. For example, if we wanted to learn how milk consumption might influence or affect bone density, we could take a large group of people and measure their bone density over a, over a period of time into the future and also measure their milk consumption and see if there's a relationship between the two. And if you look into the future, you're doing a prospective study. If you look into the past, you're doing a retrospective study. So we might take those 1,000 people and rather than track them forward, look at the differences in their bone density and then look back in their pasts, either through interviews or looking at their medical records, and see if we can find an association between those features and their bone density. But in this case, just like in surveys, we are not in any way controlling the behavior of the subjects. We are merely observing them. In an experiment, by contrast, we would control the subjects in some way. And again, if we're looking at bone density and milk consumption, we might take a 1,000 people and have some of them start a high milk diet and others a low milk diet, and then look at how their bone density changes over time. Next week, we're going to conduct an experiment to see how caffeine might affect heart rates. And when we design and conduct that experiment, we'll be using a lot of terms that I want to go over briefly with you now. The first, experimental units. Those are the subjects in an experiment, and for us, it will be all of you, so the class students. And if we're dealing with people, they're called subjects, but experimental units might also be other things. For example, in biology, they might be algae or plants. In environmental experiments, it might be the coral reef. So they don't always have to be people. Next, the response variable, that is what you're measuring in your subject. And for us, that will be the change in heart rate. And we'll decide next week how to measure that change. Next are the treatments. And we might decide next week that we are going to give our subjects either soda or coffee. And we might decide on several levels. We might decide to give either one, two, or three cups of soda, for example, to different subjects. And the explanatory variable is what we are hoping explains the response. So in our case, we are trying to isolate the effect of caffeine. Now, when we conduct an experiment, we have to watch out for what are called confounding variables. And those are variables in an experiment whose effect on the response we can't distinguish. For example, if we inadvertently give caffeine to the boys and no caffeine to the girls and then see a different response in those two groups, we don't know whether it's the gender or the caffeine that is explaining the response. So those two variables, gender and caffeine, would be confounding. Now, there are several techniques to overcome confounding variables, and we'll try to apply these in our experiment. The first is blocking. Blocks are like stratifying in a survey or an observational study. We could break our subjects into homogeneous groups, boys and girls, for example, and then within each block, we could determine a control group. We could give some students the caffeine and some students no caffeine. And that way, we would be, we would be breaking our confounding variables into two separate groups and we'd be able to study the effect of each. Now, in administering the, our treatments, we want to be careful to um, make sure we blind the subjects so that they don't know whether they're receiving the treatment or not. And in some situations, it's important to 
double blind. Not only should the subjects not know what treatment they're receiving, but the people conducting this, the experiment shouldn't either. And that's often done in medical research. Now, after an experiment's complete, it's important to consider any lurking variables because it might turn out that something we hadn't considered is causing the response that we got. For example, it's been shown that families with more television sets in their homes spend more on health care. Now, I think we'd all agree that's an association, not a causal relationship. But sometimes that, that it can be a much grayer area. And what we want to be careful to avoid saying is that buying more televisions causes you to spend more on health care. The lurking variable there is probably something related to income. People with more income tend to have more television sets, and they also tend to spend more on health care. <laughs>